tonight uh, we dive into and hopefully come out the other end of Matthew <laughs> chapter 18. Uh, I say this often, there's a lot here, but I really mean it this week. Um, those other weeks I was just, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but the first question in your lesson uh, takes you to the first verse in chapter 19, which were those famous uh, marker words when Jesus had finished, right? And so we know that what we're studying tonight is a discourse. It's one of how many? Five discourses. And what's significant about five discourses? It's to remind us of an Old Testament character, Moses, who also gave us five teachings, uh, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, Jesus is being presented yet once again as one like Moses, but also one greater than Moses. So what should we expect to see in this chapter? We should expect to see rules and regulations about how the new covenant works. Moses gave us rules and regulations about the old covenant. And so whenever Jesus teaches, what he is teaching are the rules of the new covenant. If you were here on Sunday and a week ago Sunday when I was able to administer the um, communion, the suggestion is that as believers, we need to be reminded often that we are a part of that new covenant. These are part of the rules that we agree to live by through faith, right? Not of our own works, because on our own, can we do it? No, that's the whole point. So, discourse number four of five. This one is about forgiveness. I don't know if you noticed that. Was this a hard one? Yeah, this, uh, this is going to hit everybody between the eyes in some way or another. All of us, every single one of us, have a situation in our lives right now that requires forgiveness. And I don't even know all of you that well. But I know that. And we could go around and tell our stories. We won't. <laughs> but we could. That's the point. Uh, we all transgress. We all must be willing uh, to forgive and willing to seek forgiveness when we are the ones that have caused the harm. So uh, chapter 18, verse 1. It begins at that time. I don't know if you stopped and paused and asked the question. When it says at that time, it begs a question. And the question is, at what time? because it was obviously that time. So what's, what's been going on? Well, I'm gonna suggest something to you. I don't know if this is the right answer, but it seems, based on the question that's coming about rank in the kingdom, it seems that in previous chapters, uh, there's been a, a moving up of the pecking order by Peter. Let me take you back a few chapters. In chapter 16, verse 17, Peter is publicly commended for a statement that he makes about who Jesus is. Do you remember that? Everybody gets to see that. Good job, Peter. Right? Now, you might also say, oh, but right after that, he called him the devil, right? Okay? <laughs> but if you go back in the context, that, that, uh, that statement that Jesus makes to Peter seems to be in more of a private setting, not necessarily a public so that may not have been seen by everybody. It was eventually known, obviously, but um, may not have been as public as it seems at first reading. And then in Matthew 17, just last week, Peter is one of three disciples taken up to see the transfiguration. He's one of three. And then at the very end of that chapter, what happens? He's the only one of the disciples who has this interaction with Jesus about paying taxes and a fish. And so we're coming out of a short season here, at least the way Matthew has structured it. We're coming out of a season where Peter seems to have been developing this relationship with Christ that's maybe a little different than other disciples have had a chance to develop, which maybe leads to the question that the disciples have of who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? So who is greatest in the kingdom? Jesus. They're, they're, <laughs> okay, Jesus is greatest. I, I'll grant you that. 
Um, but that's not the exact answer that Jesus gave. Uh, one word answer, Jesus, the Bible, love, you can answer that in church anytime and you're most often correct. Uh, but when asked this particular question, Jesus gave um, an interesting uh, dialogue about children. Did you notice? Um, but before he gets to the children, he, uh, he changes the question. The question is, who then is greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus says, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not. Is he answering the question about who's greatest or is he changing the question to who gets in? Which in turn maybe answers the question, who's greatest? Let's see how it flows. The question is, what's the pecking order? And Jesus says, well, to get into the kingdom, you've got to become like a child one of these children, and he picks one up. We know that from Mark. Mark 9, 36 tells us that Jesus took the child in his arms. So if you're wondering what age this child was, likely maybe a toddler. I can't imagine he's picking up a pre-adolescent in his arms. I mean, have you ever tried to pick up a pre-adolescent? Um, they just wiggle away, right? So he's probably picking up a toddler, maybe an infant, right? A young child. and. Uh, as he's holding that child, he says, it's like this. There's, children become a living parable for Jesus, a walking, living parable. He says, what's the kingdom of heaven, that unseen kingdom like? Let me give you a picture. It's like this little child. People need to become like this little child and have characteristics like this child to get into the kingdom. And when they do, Whoever receives, uh, whoever humbles himself as this child, right here, this living parable, he is, then he answers the question, greatest in the kingdom. So who's greatest in the kingdom? Everyone who gets into the kingdom is greatest in the kingdom. That's Jesus' answer. Because what adult-like person gets into the kingdom. As far as this description goes, there are no adult-like people that get into the kingdom. <laughs> to get into the kingdom, every one of us must become like a little child. And if you do that, you all are greatest in the kingdom. Do you see how he answered it? Tricky. Very tricky answer. So what does it mean to be a child? Well, some of you have uh, probably discussed that in your groups. We had a little discussion. Um, number one, I would suggest to you three things that I see that are obvious, and there's probably more. Number one, children are completely dependent, especially little children, right? Infants, little toddlers, they can't do anything for themselves. They can't tie their shoes, they can't feed themselves. They can't find the food, even if they could feed themselves, right? They're just completely dependent on somebody else taking care of them. That is a picture of what it means for you and I. That's the state you and I have to come to in our spiritual relationships with Christ. We have to be willing to be dependent. They have no status. Children have, I don't know if you've noticed, they don't hold, they don't hold any public official offices, they have no status, they're, uh, they are, they're willing to do, for the most part, what they're told. Now there's sometimes maybe a little, you know, they're willing to do what they're told. They're, they're also able to trust those who are in authority over them, right? If you've got a true child and there's a love relationship there and they say, don't do that or do that, the child will listen, right? He understands that authority structure. Children also, for the most part, seem to be unencumbered with a desire for wickedness. Now, it can be argued, you know, if you get down to the base of their soul, what does that look like? That's maybe a different question. But they're seemingly, compared to adults, children are unencumbered with desires for wickedness. Uh, they will love just about anything, right? 
Somebody walks by and we're like, ooh, don't, oh, don't even acknowledge. And the children are like, what? Hey, how are you? <laughs> right? Okay. So they seem to be unencumbered with the things that we as adults, as you grow into adulthood and you, you, you have ideas and pride and things that get in the way of how to love, they seem to be unencumbered with those things. First Peter chapter 2 uh, talks about newborn babes. Um, it says, therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander. These are all in the plural, by the way. So hypocrisies and envies and slanders. These are all the things that encumber us when we become adults, right? Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that it may, be, it may grow in respect to salvation. So um, really when it comes down to it, uh, children of the young age are concerned with just a few things. Where's my next meal, right? Where's my next diaper change, right? And is there somebody here to take care of me? And I would suggest to you that the discussion that Jesus has about little ones and children here in the beginning of Matthew, he's suggesting that of all of us. Uh, if you remember John chapter 3, he has a discussion with Nicodemus. And what does he say to Nicodemus? You must be to enter into the kingdom. It's the same premise, right? To get into the kingdom, what must you do? You must be born again. Well, if you're born again, what are you? You're an infant. Right? It's almost the exact same phraseology. So whatever you might think about the discussion with Nicodemus or this, I would just um, send it out there to you to consider what it is to become a child. And in this discussion, there's no, I'm a child in Christ and you're a mature adult in Christ. Now, you may find that language other places in the New Testament. That's a different discussion. But in this discussion about what's the ranking in the kingdom, Jesus says the rank is everybody's on equal status. And it's if you become like a child, you get in. That's the ranking. That's his answer to the question. All right. So we've answered the, the ideas about children. And now we need to talk about stumbling. Because if there's one thing little children do as they're learning to walk, it's stumble, right? So, verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Is this a literal statement? Should we take this literally? If I cause a little child to fall, do we take a big heavy stone? There's, there's some symbolism here. Uh, this millstone is uh, the top stone uh, of a grinding uh, process that would have been moved by large animals, horses or donkeys, mules. Very heavy stone. To be cast into the depth of the sea, I'm going to suggest to you is symbolism for being thrown into hell. Okay, I don't know. If, and where's Pastor Greg getting that from? Well, further down, we have uh, examples in the same discussion of stumbling about um, things being thrown into hell. And so I think the symbolism plays that way. The sea has always been considered in symbolic terms, uh, an idea that has to do with evilness. And so drowned in the depth of the sea might be sending them to hell. But what does stumbling mean? So let's talk about stumbling. Uh, stumbling is the fate of the second seed in the parable of the sower. Now you didn't think I was going back there. Matthew 13, 20 and 21, it says of this second one, uh, the one whom, whose seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, he immediately falls away. Do you see that falls away? If you scroll over 
falls away, the Greek behind that literally reads, is caused to stumble. It's the same word that we're reading here in chapter 18. So it's this person who receives something with joy, but then because of persecution or affliction, he immediately is caused to stumble. Okay, so it's that persecution, it's that affliction that causes him to stumble. So let's take that meaning back uh, with us. So it can mean, the stumbling can mean to fall away, because that's how it's translated in Matthew 13. It can mean to lead someone into sin or to sin yourself. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean, which I'll propose that if I'm causing, or if I'm leading you to sin, what am I doing? I am sinning as well, right? So it has to do with leading into a state of sinning, okay? Um, but it has also to do, we see, with something, whatever this offense is or this stumbling, it has something that could lead to a situation where somebody ends up in hell. This is a major offense, I'm going to suggest to you. So. Woe to the world, there's lots of stumbling blocks. There's lots of things that can cause you to stumble, cause you to lead in or be led into sin, cause you to get to a place where if you continue in that, you'll find yourself in hell, okay? Lots of things in the world. Inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, you can cut it off and throw it from you because it's better that you lose the thing that's causing you to go into sin than for your whole body to go into where? Into hell, okay? Because this agent, the hand, if it's leading me to sin, then my whole body's attached to that and there's a risk. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of situations where we would normally amputate our limbs I don't know if you've thought about this at all. Um, there was a movie a few years ago that I just barely made it through the whole thing because it just grossed me out, but it was called 127 Hours. Have you seen this movie? It's this true story of a climber that got his arm caught between two rocks when he was climbing by himself. You remember the story? Don't watch it. If It's just... Whew. But... After a period of time, he decided, I'm not going to make it if this arm of mine is, is in a situation that if I don't distance myself from it, what's going to happen to the rest of my body? I'm going to die. So he ends up taking a knife. And... Okay, so where else do we amputate limbs? Well, if, uh, if we've got some sort of... Uh, condition like maybe diabetes or gangrene that causes one of our limbs to have a condition that there's no hope of recovery, but also if I leave it in place, it's likely going to become septic and end the rest of our life. So that's when we sometimes amputate limbs. Um, it's when a condition quickly begins to spread, it can infect the whole body. That's what we learn from this. Sometimes we cut off one piece to save the whole body. This is the level of seriousness that Jesus has attributed to causing people, causing offense to people, causing them to stumble, leading them into a, a place where they sin. Okay? And when it comes to this word stumble, I want to show you a progression. Uh, last week I told you we would start at the, the end of the last chapter. I want to actually live up to my word there. If you go up to verse 27 of the previous chapter, what you see is this is the uh, temple tax guy who had come. And Jesus says, however, so that we do not offend. Do you see offend there? Do you know that that is the exact same Greek word as in the rest of 18? To stumble. So let's swap that out just to read it. However, so that we do not cause this pagan temple tax collector to stumble, go to the sea and throw in the hook and we'll end up paying the tax that he's asking for so that we don't cause him to stumble. Now I'm gonna show you the progression that Jesus sets us up or Matthew through Jesus sets us up for. 
Here, Jesus doesn't want to cause a pagan tax collector to stumble. Okay, that's first. And then second, who does he not want us to cause to stumble? A child, which is a symbol for all believers. So don't cause pagan people to stumble. Don't cause any believer to stumble. That's the little children. And then where does he go next? If your hand causes you. So there's a progression here. Don't cause the pagan world to stumble. Be caught, or lead, lead, don't lead them into a condition where they would be sinning. Don't cause believers to stumble. But it's even possible for you to cause yourself to stumble. And don't even do that. Do you see the progression? Do not even cause yourself to stumble because that's possible. And we see that with little children, like we mentioned before. Toddlers, when they're learning to walk, they cause themselves to stumble sometimes, right? right? The last thing we want to do, let me get this clear on tape, well, the last thing we want to do is cut off children's feet. Okay? <laughs> I've said it. Okay. So, we've got this discussion that uh, is about who's greatest in the kingdom. He answers that question with, there's really, in the type of ranking that you're talking about, there's really no ranking like that. You've misunderstood. Everybody needs to be humble. Everybody needs to be like, he actually answers this at the Last Supper when Jesus himself gets up and girds himself with a basin of water. And what does Jesus do? He humbles himself like a servant and washes the feet. And then he says, you've got to do the same thing that I'm doing. You've got to be willing to serve in this way to be in my kingdom. Okay? So we get to the lost sheep. The shepherd leaves all those who are in the fold and seeks the one that is astray, the 99 plus one. So this isn't a standalone. It'd be easy to pull this one out of context and just study it by itself, and you can do that for sure and find truth in it. But within the context of Matthew, this 99 plus one, this lost sheep, is in the context of a discussion where little ones are stumbling and falling away, right? Uh, that, that Matthew 13, one who gets persecuted and is caused to stumble, loses his way maybe, okay? So we get to see the heart of the Savior about one of these, I don't know if you noticed at the end, who are the sheep? Who's this one sheep that has lost its way? It's a little one. Where have we seen little ones before? They're right there. We've been talking about them all along. Who are the little ones? In this context, the little ones are believers. So this has been interpreted many different ways. And I'm not saying all those other ways are wrong. I'm just saying in this context, the way I am understanding it, this parable about the lost sheep is about a believer within the flock of believers who is stumbling into sin and has lost his way and become lost. And it's the Father's heart that he, we go and find that one. That's what the parable is saying. He is willing to go and find that one. And who is he going to send to go find that one? Uh, the other people in the flock, because that's what's coming next. The whole discipline that comes next has to deal with a brother who sins, who is stumbling, who has lost his way. And he's giving us in this next passage, he's giving us the practical implications of what it looks like to fulfill the parable of the 99 and the one. What does it look like for God to go get that one? Well, let's start going through the examples. What can we do if one stumbles, if one has fallen into sin? Now, there's a, a couple of things I want to point out just at the beginning. If your brother sins, now my version says if your brother sins, but if, uh, if I scroll over this little number one right here, it says some 
manuscripts add against you? How many of you have a version in your Bible that says, if your brother sins against you? What version is that? New Living? NIV. Okay. Uh, based on that uh, uh, manuscript tradition, they've included that because some of the manuscripts have that. This version, the NASB, goes with a different manuscript tradition and it goes with the ones that doesn't have that addition to it. So they've only included if your brother sins. But they've put a little one there and says, hey, we've got this thing where there's small variation. So coming into this, you might have had the uh, proclivity to read this as, oh, if somebody sins against me, this is the procedure I take. And that is true. This is the procedure you take if somebody sins against you. But I'm going to also propose that there's absolutely no difference if it's also a brother who sins, not against you. Because that is a little one, that is a sheep who has gone astray. And what are we to have the heart to do to a brother who has gone astray? whether it's against us or just in general. We should drop everything and go get them as best we can. But what is that supposed to look like? Well, let's keep reading because he answers it. We go through this process of um, a procedure. Again, remember, this is a discourse. This is Jesus outlining the law of the new covenant. This is not just a general suggestion on how you could handle it if, you know, if it worked out for you, okay? The way this is presented in discourse fashion, this is the way we are to work within the church when someone sins. We are to have the heart not to demand, for, or demand them to repent. I mean, that's not, I need to get you to admit you were, I mean, that's, it's the whole, hey, I've been forgiven much. That's where we're headed with the last parable. I've been forgiven much. I'm willing to forgive you, but dude or lady, you're astray. You're being caused to stumble right now, whether you realize it or not. And I'm going to try and get you back as best I can. Well, does that always work? No, it doesn't always work. But how does it work best? The prescription here is, number one, go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. Have a discussion with that person face-to-face, one-on-one. Can it be text message? <laughs> well, it's a valid question, right? Uh, sure, I guess. Is that best? No. Uh, I don't know. Maybe sometimes if they're in Afghanistan and I'm here, I guess I could Skype or I'm going to have to get creative, right? Okay, in some circumstances. So our technology allows us maybe to think of different avenues, the way this could play out. But face-to-face -face is always good, right? It's always maybe a little harder too. Don't shy away from hard because um, it can be good. So go one-on-one. -on -one. This is not a step that can be stepped. There's a step that can be skipped. Let me just say that again. Going one-on-one -on -one to somebody and in love, right? Pointing out their sin is not a step that can be skipped. So if you're a type of person that wants to gather the two or three, that's step number one, you need to back up a little bit. You need to give it a shot. You need to try it then if that doesn't work, if you've done your job correctly by going in love, not accusatory, not... If that doesn't work, what's the ultimate goal? We want to get this sheep back in the fold. That's the ultimate goal, is to get them back in the fold. So then I take two, P, two or three with me. Are these just my friends that are on my side? <laughs> Well, they could be, but that's not exactly what I think the point is. The point is, let's get some people that maybe everybody trusts, right? Because what's the ultimate goal? To make sure I'm right? No. To make sure we get 
sheep back in the fold. So let's get somebody that the sheep trusts because we're going to try and talk them off a ledge, maybe. We're out of a culvert. We're away from a snake, right? So let's get people that they trust so that when they speak alongside me, the sheep maybe is apt to listen. But that's not always going to work. And so what's the third step? Well, take it before the church. Well, this becomes very confusing because we've made the church something that it wasn't in the first century. Um, we have a building where we invite everybody in, believers or non-believers. In fact, we almost prefer it if non-believers come, right? That's the whole purpose of opening our doors. And that's what we call the church. But that wasn't the situation here. So figuring out how this is going to play out exactly, we'd have to figure out what is the modern day equivalent of what he's prescribing here. And I don't have all the answers, nor do I want to try to attempt that. But that is one of the problems that we run into when we read this. Even when we take it before the church, though, well, whatever that looks like, what's the ultimate goal? To prove that they're wrong? The ultimate goal is to bring that sheep back into the fold. But even that sometimes doesn't work. And so what's the ultimate prescription, the end of this process? What's it say? If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church, and if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Most of us here are Gentiles, so that's easy. But that's not what he means, right? A tax collector. Matthew's writing this, who was a tax collector. He knows what he's talking about. One who's not in the fold, in other words. A sheep not in our fold. Well, and again, I don't have a prescription for what this is supposed to look like exactly because if we go through this entire process, let's say with me, and I don't respond to any of these things, and you then are to treat me like a Gentile or a tax collector, what do we do with non-believers in our culture? We invite them to church. <laughs> so we're... It becomes rather confusing in the setup that we've created in America in our time. But that doesn't mean, just because it gets interesting and we have to get creative to try and figure out, that doesn't say we don't get, have to do this. And I think sometimes the perception is, well, we're not really going to take them before the church because that would be embarrassing if we stood them up on a Sunday morning in front of the whole right? We're not going to do that. That could bring a lawsuit, right? In our culture, the way we've set up church. I agree. That's probably not what this is talking about. But just because that isn't it doesn't mean there's not something that is it. And we have to get creative about what that looks like, just in the same way we have to get creative about how we're going to meet with someone one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, the whole goal in this is not to get somebody to admit they're wrong, to get them to repent so that you feel better about yourself. The whole thing is about forgiveness and bringing them back into the fold because we want everybody to get into heaven because that's God's perspective. And if that's not our perspective, then we're looking at this heaven thing differently than we should be, right? I think that's what we get out of this. Um, uh, a couple more minutes here. You might notice in uh, 18, uh, verses 17 and 18, uh, actually specifically 18, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Does that uh, language sound familiar? It should. This is what Jesus said to Peter when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God hands him the keys to the kingdom, and then he says to Peter individually, I made that clear in chapter 16, and I said when we get to 18, I'm going to have you go back and listen. Do you remember? Okay. This is where this ends us up. But these yous, whatever you bind on earth, in chapter 16, those were singular yous directed directly to Peter, so it looked like Peter was being um, uh, brought out and singled out. But here, it's the exact same statement, but they're plural yous, and they're attached to the church. 
the church. Listen even to the church. And then whatever you, that you means, whatever you little children, whatever you flock of God, you believers, bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Well, what does that even mean? Well, I'm going to suggest that if this procedure is done correctly, are there ways to mess this up? Yes. Many ways. It's easier to do it wrong than it is to do it right. But if it's done correctly, this process ratifies the perspective that God already has on the situation. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. It's already the case in heaven. So if we go through this process of restoring a brother back into the fold correctly, this process will ratify the truth that already exists in heaven. That's exciting because we get to glimpse into the heavenly unseen realm of the way God works. People that we had no expectation that would ever repent and come back are coming back because we followed the procedure correctly. Now, does everybody come back? No, because not everybody's going to make it into heaven. That's not even popular to say anymore. But if the procedure is done correctly, it ratifies God's perspective on the situation. And the flip side is also true. If the procedure is done incorrectly, it completely confuses the picture of the heart of God. If we go to try and exact this procedure on somebody with our own interests in mind, the picture of God is completely confused in the world in which we live. We have an opportunity to show the world the way God works. But we need to be humble, and we need to take instruction, and we need to be dependent and follow. As we finish, we have a, um, uh, we have a parable of a king who settles accounts with his slaves. And again, this is not a standalone. This is in conclusion. Uh, this is the whole picture of what it is, what it looks like in the heavenly realm. Um, what's the ranking? Well, you've got God, and then you've got slaves. And God has forgiven the slaves. And so we need to forgive the slaves as well, the fellow slaves. That's even what it says. Um, I don't know if you got into, if you have notes in your Bible or something, I'm just gonna make these last couple comments. Um, 10,000 talents, uh, this first amount that's forgiven by the king to the first slave. It's uh, a, a talent uh, is, let me get this straight, uh, a talent was about 90 pounds of silver as I understand it. It was enough to commission, one talent was enough to commission the building of a warship, okay? So if you have 10,000 talents, you have the, enough money to build an armada, okay? 10,000 warships. Huge debt, in other words. Amazing, never be able to repay it. And that's being forgiven. And then the, um, the 100 days, uh, the, the amount in 1828 is about, some have guessed, about 100 days wages. So it's still a debt, it's still a significant debt, but it's not 10,000 talents, okay? In both cases, I want you to notice something. In verse 26, the first slave, he fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you. That's the first slave. The second slave, so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you. It's the same response, but let's look beyond the parable. What is that response? That is, in the, in the prospect of the whole chapter, we're talking about sheep that go astray, where we're talking about little children that can stumble. And when you go to someone and you tell them of the sin that they're causing, whether it's against you or just in general, if they repent, you've won them back, right? 
That's what this is a picture of. It's, this is a picture of that repentance. It's that heart of, I've got a debt that I can't handle on my own. I need help, right? And spiritually speaking, that's us. And we need to have the same heart that brings us to our knees and lets our face fall on the ground before our God and say, I've got a problem and I can't fix it. And I'm willing to repay, but I'm going to need some time. And we have a God that says, you know what? There's no way you can do it by yourself. And when we fully realize that that's our condition, it allows us to go into this procedure of sitting down one-on-one -on -one with a brother who is going astray. When we realize what we've been forgiven of, we can then approach our brother and appropriately talk to that person about the sin that they're caught in because we know we've been forgiven of the same thing and how good it is to be in the fold and how much we want you back, right? This whole chapter is about how forgiveness works in the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 18, it's a discourse it's a teaching of Jesus. And as fellow children, it is something we've agreed to do. And uh, I was talking with someone before, um, it may seem like this is hitting you right square in the face. <laughs> it probably is. And it probably needs to. But just realize this is hitting everybody. Everybody has a situation where you need forgiveness and you need to forgive somebody. What does forgiving mean? Because, uh, and I'll end with this. Forgiveness, I, I don't want to uh, misrepresent what forgiveness is. Forgiveness oftentimes is lumped in together with forgetting. And I, I want to make it clear that there's nowhere where forgetting an offense means I, or forgiveness of offense means I just need to forget all past behavior and continue on hoping things get better, okay? This has been misconstrued in a number of different uh, abusive situations where someone in the church has maybe been told, you need to forgive and forget. And by that they mean forgive and continue just in that situation the way it is. Now, throughout this chapter, we've seen repentance being a part of that process. And if somebody's repenting, I think, I think that triggers something in what type of response we need to have, definitely. But I want you to think of forgiveness this way. Forgiveness is the ability that we have to say, I am not going to be the one that exacts the judgment on this situation. Because it is not my situation to exact, exact judgment upon I'm going to hand that one to God. He ultimately is the judge who gets to figure all this out. I'm going to act responsibly, but in my willingness to forgive something, what I'm saying is, I don't need to be the one that makes sure they pay. I can hand that one off to God. But that in no way means I then have to walk back into a, a situation with an unrepentant person, right? So I think there's some wisdom that has to go along with how do we act in situations where forgiveness needs to be applied? And what does that look like? Okay? All right. Let's pray. This is a hard one. Dear God, thanks for uh, chapter 18, a chance to look at your heart. Um, and what seems sometimes like an impossible standard of forgiveness. Uh, and God, although we may not fully understand on every single case how that's supposed to play out in our culture, we do know that you've given us instructions and you've given us enough wisdom to know that we can't skip the steps. So God, give us wisdom as we go about our days. Let us realize that the way we handle forgiveness in our culture 
is an opportunity to show other people who you are. And give us the strength and mercy uh, to reflect that correctly. In Jesus' name, amen.